Budget 2025 was announced on Friday. The total came out at $421 billion, 6.9% higher than last year's budget or this year's budget, if you were to put it that way. And the main three recipients are the Education, Finance and Health Ministry, which in total receive about 40 to 41% of the budget. Now, first things first, bonus retirement savings for informal workers and freelancers. I think this is a great policy. EPF ISRN matching scheme has been increased from 15% previously to 20%. Now, the annual limit still stays at 500 ringgit. The lifetime limit still stays at 5,000 ringgit. Uh, but this is to encourage informal workers and those without a fixed income to contribute to their retirement savings. So, if you're not employed or you have kids that are age 14 and above, please, please, please go to EPF's website, apply for an account, then head over to iSaraan to begin contributing to your EPF and you will start receiving your annual 20% bonus. So previously, you need to contribute about 3,333 ringgit in order to receive this uh, 500 ringgit bonus. But now, from 2025 onwards, we will only need to contribute 2,500 ringgit. So up next, more cash aid. I think this is a good thing, although uh, it's largely debatable. Right? Uh, single individuals, they will receive 600 ringgit under the Sumangan Tunai Rahmah program, uh, which is up from 500 ringgit this year. The cash boost expected to benefit 9 million recipients, accounting for 60% of the adult population. So there's no official announcement on how they will distribute this. I'm assuming it's going to be similar like e-Madani credits, okay? And you can check your eligibility by going to Google and searching for Sumbangan Tunai Rahma eligibility. Yeah, then the first link, I think is from Bantuan Rakyat website or something like that. Uh, you can check whether you are eligible for this relief or not. So there is an additional cash of 100 ringgit per month, yeah, so which is about 1.2k per year lah, to 4.1 million households under the Sumbangan Asas Rama Sara program. So these two are separate programs. Huh? The monthly cash aid will be credited to recipients my card starting April 2025, which can be used on over 600 stores and supermarkets nationwide. So why do I think this is uh, quite a good policy? Because uh, it will not only give citizens more cash to spend, it will also boost Malaysia's economy next year. So we'll move on over to salaries and wages. This one I think is a decent implementation. Yeah, the minimum wage has been finally raised to 1,700 ringgit from previously 1.5k, uh, effective February 2025. Uh, but the uh, micro businesses, i.e. companies with fewer than five workers, they will be given a time extension until August 1st. So this 1.7k is only like a benchmark for unprofessional sectors. Yeah, there's wage guidelines for all of the other employment sectors, i.e. the starting salary of a production technician is 2.3k, mechanical engineer is about 3.4k, creative content design professional is about 3k. So I think this uh, progressive wage policy, which is uh, piloted since June this year, Anwar said it will continue to be implemented. I think it's a good policy. Uh, it will definitely raise Malaysia's minimum wage up and up. But some people are unsatisfied with this implementation, stating that, hey, 200 ringgit in the long run is not going to make a lot of difference, especially when MPs, they are receiving 2,500 ringgit for their entertainment budget. Right, so the I would say the comments are endless, but I think this is a good start. Okay, there's no way the government can suddenly raise the minimum wage from 1.5k to 2.5k. That way, it will definitely destroy small and micro businesses. Right, so well, we're gonna start somewhere. Next is uh, subsidy rationalization. Now this one will affect everyone. So targeted subsidies for RON95 will be enforced by mid 2025. The top 15%. Yeah, they will be most affected by this rationalization. The remaining 85% of the population, uh, they will still receive few subsidies. The government is actually considering my card verification to pump RON95. Uh, but I think this policy is very questionable uh, because it will depend on your total household income, not individual income. You know. So in this case, if let's say we have like a, a family yeah, who, whose father is the sole breadwinner of the family yeah, and the family is like a family of five. So father earns about uh, more than 14K per month, but they are taking care of their wife and three other kids. In this case, 
that household will not be eligible for subs for the uh, subsidies for Ron 95. You know? So it's a bit unfair. Uh, in fact, if your husband, if your husband will earn 6.5k and you yourself earn another 6.5k, you exceed the 13th k per month threshold, you will no longer be eligible for Ron 95 subsidies. Now that is uh, stirring a lot of tension on X right now. And if you look at the monthly household income required to be T15, right? It's actually not a lot, you know. You only need above 13K. And at the end of the day, if you have a large family, you will definitely exceed that household income. In this case, you won't be eligible for petrol subsidies, which is questionable to say the least. Right, we'll move on over to tax reliefs. Now, there are lots of different tax reliefs, uh, so I'll just cover the important ones. Yeah, first one, for retirement savings, the 3,000 ringgit annual limit for PRS has been extended to 2030. Then we also, has, we also have SSPN education savings, 8,000 limit has been extended to 2027. There's also like a tax reliefs for first time home buyers, which I didn't include in this slide here today. If your property value is below 500,000 ringgit, you will get a tax relief of 7,000 ringgit. Or if your property is valued between 500,000 to 750,000 ringgit, you will get a 5,000 ringgit tax relief. Right, so that's it about budget 2025. On the surface, I think it takes quite a lot of the boxes, a lot of economists, analysts, they are positive on this budget because it addresses a few key areas, yeah, i.e. wages, as well as the petrol subsidies, right? So uh, only time will tell if uh, it will work in our favor. Right, let's move on over to money lessons I wish I knew earlier. Now, the first one I want to talk about is inflation. Right, for those of you guys, you open up your bank account right now and you're seeing a lot of money there, more than five digits, well, you should be a bit worried lah, because inflation is the silent killer of money in your bank account. And an easy way to visualize this is to use the rule of 72. So you take 72, you divide it by the rate of inflation, then that's the half-life of your money, i.e. the time taken for your money to lose half of its value. So the table over here, shows pretty clearly on how long it takes for your money to lose half of its value. 2% yeah, inflation rate, 36 years. 3% inflation rate, 24 years, so on and so forth. You guys can do the math yourself. La. Now, the rule of 72 can also be used on the flip side, yeah, i.e. the time taken to double your money. So if you're investing and your average return is 4 to 5%, you're a very conservative investor, even though you have a long investing horizon, right? but you have like a 4-5% to return, in this case, it will take 14-18 to 18 years for your current funds, assuming no further contributions, uh, to double itself. But just by exploring slightly riskier investments, right? you invest in aggressive mutual funds, or stocks, or a bit of crypto or whatnot, right? you increase your return rate by a mere 2%, the time taken to double your money is 4-8 to eight years quicker. Okay, so which is why, for those of you guys who are young, make sure you try and explore riskier options. Now, on the topic of inflation, Malaysia's annual inflation averaged about 2% in the past decade. So from this equation over here, you take about 36 years to lose half of your money. But the majority of you will say that, I don't think inflation is at this range. I feel that it's much higher. Well, that's because inflation is not equal to everyone. Yeah, it heavily depends on what types of goods and services that you purchase the most. For B40s and M40s, we tend to go to restaurants, we tend to spend on groceries, housing, utilities, gas, and other fuels. And in this case, you can see that the inflation is actually 50% higher compared to the national average. And this is why we feel like our money is losing value much faster compared to what is reported by the Department of Statistics. Uh, because based on this uh, equation over here, it's 24 years, right? It's 12 years quicker uh, for your money to lose half of its value. Next, uh, inflation tracks the rate of price increases over time, which means as long as the value is positive, uh, your money will continue to depreciate. Yeah, a lot of people tend to misunderstand this uh, when the Department of Statistics reports that Oh, Malaysia's inflation has slowed from 2.2% last month to 1.9% right now. And then the right here says, I don't even see my prices going down. Well, that's because inflation is still a positive number. As long as it's a positive number, prices will continue to rise, albeit at a slower pace. Yeah, the only scenario where prices will not rise or in fact decrease is when inflation goes into negative territory, i.e. deflation. 
Okay. So how to counteract inflation? Well, if you follow the futurists, you know what we're talking about. You know what we're always advocating, right? These days, there are so many digital banks, cash apps. You can sign up very easily, instantly, in five minutes, in fact. And the deposit requirements are often very low, as low as one ringgit, right? So all of this, this table, I will send to you guys during the Q&A session. And uh, you can explore it and see how to grow your savings and beat inflation. Right, let's move on over to owning a car. So recently, I came across this post regarding an agent saying that uh, a young man wants to buy a Mercedes A45S Formatic Plus priced at 312,000 ringgit with a salary of 3,000 ringgit per month. So the agent was shocked, you know. And I looked at this post, I'm also shocked because the down payment actually is more than 200,000 ringgit. Well, typically, uh, if you have like a good credit score and you pay your debts on time, right, the down payment to own a new car is 10 to 20%. But in this case, this young man is applying for a loan that is much higher than what is allowed by the bank. That's why number one, his down payment is significantly higher, 60 to 70%, and it has to be signed with a guarantor in case he cannot repay his debts. So uh, I'm not going to talk about youngsters these days, but anyway, if you're asking the question, what sort of salary, uh, my current salary is 3K, what sort of car can I own? Well, you can follow these two very simple rules. Okay, Number one, Buy a car that's close or equal to your annual salary. Obviously, the lower the better. Yeah, the lower the cost of the car, the better. Next is a bit more complex. You use the 2720 rule. So the first rule, pretty straightforward, right? You take your annuals, you take your annual salary, which is monthly 3,000 ringgit, annual 36,000 ringgit. Then you can comfortably afford the lower tiers of Beza, Axia, and Saga. But this doesn't take into account the cost of the loan as well as your down payment. In this case, you should use the 2720 rule also. 20% yeah, down payment, seven year loan tenor, and making sure that your monthly installments are less than 20% of your income. So when it comes to loan tenors, right, there are typically three types, yeah, five year, seven year, and nine years. So as much as possible, you want to go for loans that are shorter so that you'll pay less in total interest. But when your loans are shorter, right, your monthly commitments are also higher. So this 2720 rule states that why not you just go for the middle, right? Why not you just opt for a seven-year loan? You don't pay that much interest, but you, are st you still can manage yeah, at the same time, ensuring that your monthly installments for your loan is less than 20% of your income. And this is very important uh, because there are a lot of other costs when it comes to owning a car. Road tax, insurance, maintenance, wear and tear, and this infrequent costs, which depend on how much you use the car, right? Petrol, parking, and tow charges which eventually, at the end of the day, add up to add up and will eat into your income. So this is why, if you're owning a car right now, make sure your loan repayments are well below that 20% of your monthly income. So when it comes to this, right, uh, there is a table calculated by Ringgit Plus. You need to have a gross monthly salary of 7,000 Ringgit per month to comfortably afford a Proton X50, Honda City or Honda WRV, which if you use the 2720 rule and you use the first rule, right, these two relate to each other very closely. Right? You take 7,000, you multiply it by 12, that's 84,000 ringgit per year, which is close to all of these car prices. Next, let's move on over to bankruptcy. Uh, this is another interesting post that I saw online. Uh, this person actually wants to take a personal loans to cover all of their current loans. Yeah, they have PTPTN, 7K, Kuku 2.5K, their DG bill, every month is 70 ringgit, and paying money to their parents, every month is 150. Car, every month is like 720. Then it's a buy now, pay later master. Got loan from Shopee, got loan from S pay later, grab pay later, etc. Et it's endless, lah, okay? And what he is doing is actually digging another grave to fill his own grave because he's using buy now, pay later loans to pay off his original loans. And if you guys are doing this right now, please stop. It's a massive red flag, really a one-way trip to bankruptcy. As the Malays call it, uh, gali lubang untuk tutup lubang. I hope I pronounced it correctly, okay? Or English idiom is like robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, digging a new grave for yourself to cover your own grave, right? It's really an unsustainable way to repay your debts. And this thing about buy now, pay later, it's attracting a lot of youngsters these days because it gives you the illusion of affordability. When you buy things upfront with cash, such as an iPhone 16 Pro Max, upfront it costs 6,000 ringgit. 
definitely you will think three to four times, maybe even 10 times when you want to spend this amount of money. But when it comes to paying it across three years, 167 ringgit per month, a lot of people won't even think twice about it because on the surface wise, it looks cheap. But at the end of the day, the question boils down to whether you can afford this with cash or not. So I'm not saying that buy now, pay later is bad. A lot of people use it and they manage their finances well. And this is how they do it, right? Number one, they make sure they can cover the item that they want to buy with cash. And they save up enough money first. Number two, they put this money into cash apps to generate them some return to beat inflation. And at the same time, they repay back these debts on time. That is the only scenario when you can use buy now, pay later. Not for you to, you know, I can afford everything because the monthly repayments are low. My salary is 3K per month. Let's go. Let's buy an iPhone 16 Pro Max. Let's buy this Apple Watch. Let's buy this Adidas shoes, right? So definitely have to think twice about that. Now, another thing about buy now, pay later is that even if it has 0% interest, right? If you miss any, the cost of these payments will quickly add up in fees and penalties. At Shopee, they charge 1.5% per month, which is 18% per year plus 10 ringgit in late fees yeah, if you don't manage to cover your payments. Then. And for those of you guys who are uh, struggling with debt, yeah, please look for a certified financial planner or head over to this website, AKPK. Yeah, by the way, I'm not sponsored by them. Uh, they offer sound advice on how to manage your debt and how to repay it in the most sustainable way possible. And that brings me to the end of my uh, presentation tonight. Hopefully you guys learned something. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. So meanwhile, shout out to all our gatherer members. Yeah, thank you so much for your support. CH, Andrew, Wendy, Alex, CC, Urshad, Caveman, Kelvin, Tommy, Jinkang, Adrian, JS, Wen Yen, Dean, Duhan, Sufi, Faris, Alan, Jackson, Ryzen, Hudson, G, Jeffrey, Lawrence, Lukman, Will, Jack, YC, Arif, Hazik, Jinden, Adam, Ashley, Sean, Jason, Putra, Alvin, Jaya, Jia Chen, and Aldrin as well as uh, all of our learner members. Bye guys. Good night. Stay safe.